My name is Esteban Maringolo. I'm not an engineer, working as a senior software developer at Instantations. And in today's presentation, I will be talking about the upcoming Unicode support for all our database libraries. As part of the agenda, I will go over some topics that are more conceptual or fundamental to understand what we did, and they are related to databases in general, and others that are best specific um, related to our database libraries and Unicode support. And for those that are new to how we implemented Unicode support in, in VAST, we'll also we'll do a quick recap on, on the basic concepts. And of course, at the end, we'll, we'll have time for questions and we'll show you the next steps. So let's move on to some of the conceptual parts of this talk, at least the, the things you have to understand before, to understand what we did with the databases. And the first thing to understand are the code pages. And to do that, we must know what is a code page. And the simple explanation for that is that it is how we dealt with international strings before Unicode was a thing, basically. And actually, it is still how we deal with international strings when you don't have Unicode support. At the implementation level, it just consists of, on a table mapping codes, meaning bytes, uh, to some different characters that are going to be displayed on the strings, on a stream, I mean. And... There are some regions in that table that actually are similar between different code pages and others that are completely different that is actually the purpose of its existence. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm just referring to Western single byte code pages. I know there are double byte or variable length code pages and encodings. And, and here, sorry, I was clicking there. As I was saying, they have different you can use the same byte to different characters. The code page must be known in advance, otherwise you will start getting those wonky characters in, in your screen, which is very common in the, or was common in the early days of email. And one of the limitations here is you have uh, basically a limited set of characters that you can display with a single code page. Here we have one of the most well-known uh, code pages, the Latin one code page. You can see that you have, well, uh, the first seven bits are common between others. Here, I don't know if you, if you are able to tell, but if I switch, for instance, to the Greek code page, you can see that b uh, beyond a range, you, you see different characters. And then we have the Windows 1252 uh, code page, which is like the, the most common used code page in Windows uh, in the Western world, but which actually uses some, some characters that are not available in the other, in the other code pages. Fortunately, Unicode was designed to be better. Uh, with a proper separation of concerns, decoupling the coded characters from how that is represented uh, as bytes, as bytes by means of an encoding. Uh, usually using one of the available UTF encodings, and UTF-8 is like the most well-known uh, one because it's very efficient when it, when it comes to encoding ASCII characters or our characters that are in the ASCII range, which is like uh, in, in web and many other platforms, actually in Latin languages as well, like the, the majority of the characters. So now we made a clear distinction on what is a code page and how Unicode encoding works, basically a code page. In, in most cases, the code page and encoding was kind of the same thing. Unicode separates that, it specifies what is a character and how it is, is going to be encoded. So let's see, or let me, let's make a quick recap on how we support Unicode in VAST. So given VAST's long history, we've been dealing with code page dependent strings for a long time. And with our support for Unicode, we removed the limitations associated with uh, working with code pages and introduced new abstractions to, that simplifies the use of Unicode while providing better ergonomics for the developers. So I will show you basically a comparative table here. We have a classical string that works 
uh, as a bytes container. So let's say you have a, a, a string that contains a character and the character has some value. Well, that value will be displayed differently if you have the right code page configured or if you have a wrong code page configured. This, the, the string is composed, as, as we know, as characters and the, the, the values are also code page dependent. On the Unicode side, we have uh, the newly introduced Unicode string class, which is a collection of graphemes. I will mention what is a grapheme later. That is mutable, so basically it, it grows in the same, very same way as a uh, Northern collection does. And its internal storage is always validated UTF-8. Then we have the grapheme, which is the user perceived character, basically what the user see on the screen. And it can be composed, or it is actually composed, uh, by one or more Unicode scalers. And what is a Unicode scalar? Well, it's actually what you will find um, in the Unicode database, basically the Unicode table that represents a Unicode code point. And borrowing this slide from a prior presentation, we can visually see what, what each of the Unicode abstraction means. As you can see here from top down, you, we have different scalars that can be composed into graphemes. Uh, the graphemes is what other languages call grapheme clusters. And then when we collect those together, we get what is a Unicode string. So basically a Unicode string has like three, devil, three uh, levels of compositions, like this Unicode string, the graphemes, and the scalars. I, I, it's worth mentioning that there are only a few programming languages that support what is considered the grapheme cluster. We took inspiration from Rust and Swift that are like the best implementations available. And actually our implementation is based on, on Rust primitives and we added all the ergonomics to make it feel more like, like we like as a small dog developers. And of course, in the same image, you can have um, and you will likely have both types of a string coexisting. And to deal with that, there are ways to convert from one class of a string to the other. You, you can always convert a code page dependent strings to, to Unicode strings, and that's going to be a lossless uh, code page to UTF-8 conversion. And Unicode strings can be converted to single byte um, code page dependent strings, but of course, they're you can lose data there because, for instance, you cannot represent an emoji in a Latin one code page. And in order to support that or to actually deal with the, that kind of differences, our code page converters have different policies like being a strict. Basically, it's going to complain or fail if it's if it cannot map a character from Unicode to, to a code page. But, the character is going to ignore, basically use the the well-known replacement character, like usually the question mark there, or it's going to transliterate in some cases where it's going to find the, the closest one. And this is all defined in tables. It's not something that actually we make up. So at this point, we already know uh, what is the code page, how Unicode separate code points and encoding, and how deal uh, how vast deals with different types of strings. Now the question is, how do databases support Unicode? And to mention that, I, I want to let's say that usually the terms code page, char set, and encoding are used interchangeably, even when they mean different things. So for the most part, I will use the word encoding, which is uh, the term often used in Unicode context. And it, when co it comes to data types, there are normally two primary groups. We have like the database or, or primary data types, and we have the national, which is like the N prefix uh, types uh, that usually have a separate encoding from the one defined in the, in the database. For instance, the bar chart, which is like the, one of the most used uh, string types in databases, it is uh, you can, it, in, most of the time, it, it inherits the encoding from the database configuration, although some database engines allow you to define a specific encoding per column or per table. But the national varchar is, uh, has 
historic reasons to exist. And it was created when UTF or Unicode support wasn't widely available in databases and you needed to store Unicode related uh, data in, in, in the tables. So for that, the, the chosen encoding was to use UTF-16. So it's very common to have that in all the, in all the databases. But not all the databases supported national bar charts. For instance, let's say uh, Postgres doesn't support it. Um, some other platforms, what they do is they alias uh, this type to the regular bar chart type and they store it in the, in the encoding of their preference. And the database is going to do all the conversions for you. And speaking of database and connections, it is uh, the database driver what usually does all the heavy lifting of mapping what's the encoding, the encoding uh, used uh, with the data at rest to what the client wants to get. So for instance, um, is you can have the server using, let's say a Latin one or our server database using UTF-8 and the client is going to be a Latin 15 one and all the conversion can happen on the server. Some engines will do the conversion on the server side and send the, the bytes already uh, converted for the target code page, or some of that is done by the driver locally. So you receive UTF-8 from the server and the client driver is going to do the conversion on the client side. And of course, it, it, this goes both ways. When you read, it's, going, it's coming from the server and when, you, and when you write something to the database, it's going to be converted as well. So we start to see now we have like the code pages, Unicode, we see like uh, different data types. Now we have to, because this is about our integration of Unicode into our database libraries. So we need to at least understand what are the main abstractions in the database libraries of BAST. And from top to bottom, we have uh, the DVM system that is uh, basically a utility class that helps with defining globals and some defaults and of course coordinates what are the managers that is there is one manager class per platform so you have we have one for for postgres odbc oracle etc the manager is the the class that actually creates and deals with connection reuse or shoot down or stop or startup of the whole platform uh, libraries etc we have the database connection that, well, it's like, it's like the most used thing in other systems that deals with transaction management, preparing statements, executing them, et cetera. And then we have the, the cursors or the database rows that deal with iteration or results and are actually abstractions over the rows. Uh, it is worth mentioning that, for instance, uh, for those drivers that are, wrap, are wrapping like native drivers like Oracle and DB2, for instance, or even ODBC, you, let's say you fetch uh, a, a row with 100 columns with lots of data. That data is not going to be on the small talk memory. It's going to reside outside until you actually fetch into that. That's, that's actually very performant. And well, we have customers using that extensively. And finally, we have the database field. This is basically kind of a metadata or, and works as an accessor to the values in the, in the rows that are actually in, in cursors. So in order to add Unicode support to this set of abstractions, we modify the existing classes in a way that allow us, um, our users to enable or disable Unicode support at different levels. You can do it globally. It says all the database related things are going to use Unicode. You can do it at the database manager level. So saying, okay, I want to use Unicode, Unicode only for let's say uh, Oracle or Postgres. And you can define the UTF encoding that's going to be used. Usually it is uh, UTF-8. Or you can do it at the dat database connection level. So basically per instance, I want this database connection to uh, give me Unicode strings and I want the other database connection to give me regular code page dependent strings. And you can also define uh, UTF encoding if you're actually using 
Unicode in that connection. And then the, the cursor and the row is actually what is going to inject all that data, in particular the UTF encoding, into, into what's the database field that is going to be the accessor, as I say, that's going to read or write the Unicode strings uh, to or from bytes. So given what I showed you before, you should be good to go. So basically we did everything in a way that is going to be easy to use. It's just enabling that. But some database platforms have minor requirements uh, to enable Unicode. For instance, Oracle normally doesn't enable UTF-8 by default. It's something that you have to, to do on the client driver. And it's very simple. In the case of Oracle, it requires you to define uh, a specific NVAR, like the NLS lang, just to define the language territory and encoding, uh, or you just can define the encoding, as you can see in the second example. It has an extra parenthesis there. And in DV2 is something similar. You can see they refer to DV2 code page 1208, which is the UTF-8, or you can use a different number if you want to use UTF-16, which is very rare, but you can. And in the case of ODBC, we have uh, is like the special one in this group uh, because uh, ODBC, being a Windows uh, only driver, it requires a, a Unicode API. Basically, like in Windows, you have like the ANSI API and the Wide API, which is meant to be used with Unicode. So if you are going to use ODBC and Unicode, you just make to a, uh, you have to be sure that the driver you're using supports. Uh, Unicode. For instance, Postgres has one driver for ANSI, one for Unicode. Um, DB2, the same driver, provides both. SQL Server, same thing. And this is something also worth mentioning, is that all the strings are going to be encoded or decoded from UTF-16 because all the wide API uses UTF-16. So there might be an extra overhead there, but it's negligible for the most part. Postgres QL is client but it's already UTF-8 unless you're doing something really odd uh, it's hard to actually not use UTF-8 in Postgres uh, on the client side on the server side by default is also UTF-8 you can have something else but it doesn't require anything on your side and SQLite uh, the text type also is UTF-8 by default unless you recompile the the whole library differently but it's again it's not something that you do normally I'm um, just going to give you a quick example on, on how this is done. So you can see there, there is like a, in the line number seven, there's an enable Unicode at the connection level. And that's all you need to do to enable Unicode. It's just that. And after that, when you query a string, uh, basically when you read a string from the database, instead of getting an instance of a string, you're going to get instances of Unicode strings. And if I inspect, for instance, in the hello world thing I got back, you can see that instead of getting a, the last character was not a, a character, but a grapheme instead. And you can see all the metadata saying that it's like globe with meridians uh, grapheme. And the Unicode support we added doesn't end at the base layer of database support. We also added support to our officially supported object relational mapper which is the well-known GLORP uh, framework. And enabling Unicode support in GLORP is also pretty straightforward. The only remark is that GLORP uh, manages the creation of connections using a concept called uh, database accessor that actually deals with all the connections, um, all the creation by itself. And we could add like an enable Unicode at the database accessor level, but we prefer to not modify the base or, or the code base of Glorp because even when we have our own fork of the project, we try to be as close as possible to the to the to the to the code to the code base used in other dialects. And because of this, the way to enable this is not that you you won't you won't be able to do it, but you you will always enable that at the database manager level. So basically, let's say you're using Postgres with Glorp. Well, you enable that at the Postgres database manager, and then all the Postgres connections are going to be Unicode uh, enabled. 
If for whatever reason you want to disable Unicode at a particular level, you can always disable that at that particular connection. One thing that we added, and we added a new mapping, which is the string dictionary mapping that is uh, optimized to be used when you are mixing uh, strings at Unicode strings, because in, in in past they are the API is mostly uh, equivalent for both. I mean, they are compatible to to a large extent, but for instance, they they have a different hashing. So in this case, this dictionary mapping is going to use uh, the same hashing for for both. And if you are mixing uh, classes of strings, this will work better. And everything else just works. Basically, it's the same thing. Once you enable that, you will start using Unicode right right away. You will be able to store Unicode strings and do that, yeah, basically without having to deal with code page conversions, with thinking about code pages or what encoding is that thing using. So let's wrap this up. Uh, Unicode support is optional uh, because we it was added in a way that won't disrupt users that want to continue using code page dependent strings on basically they want to use Unicode or maybe later or not now. And when it's enabled, it means that instead of using strings, you're going to, to use Unicode strings. Uh, basically, it's going to read Unicode strings from the database, but it can always take strings and Unicode strings as input you know, for data in columns or for statements or for whatever you want. So you can still use like the traditional strings, let's say for a select or update a statement. And this journey doesn't end here. So let me share with you all uh, what are the next steps for Unicode support in BAST. This is a long project. And I said it before, but it's always good to remark that one of our main principles is to extend uh, Unicode support without forcing our any changes on our current users who might choose not to use it. Uh, as I said, uh, Mariano's presentation yesterday, he talked about the migration guide. Every time the user is forced to do something, it has to go, to go in that migration guide and enabling something this big basically would require a whole book maybe of changes. Even if the API is compatible, there's always some rough edges that you have to cover. So, and all of that, of course, is to preserve the, the stability of the BAST platform itself. So if you are a BAST user and would like to prioritize any of the items in this list, uh, maybe, or maybe to be an early tester of the Unicode database support, just let us know. And if you have any questions about anything I presented today, I think that now is the moment to ask them. Thank you. I, I have a question. It's not about the database support, but the about Unicode. The, on the slide, you the last slide you show the grapheme, uh, a, a graph, an inspector on a grapheme at the right side. It's oh. a, a code. Yeah. What is the code for a grapheme if it can be made of a sequence of uh, Unicode's colors? Yes, and actually you can see grapheme. It has actually kind of an, a collection inspector, and you see one there. That's the first element. That's actually in a scalar. Okay, I so know. I, I can show you live if well okay. later. But yes, that's actually in this case, it's just a single scalar, which is the emoji. But it could be like a, I don't know non-visual scalars. I, I got it. Thank you. Hi, this is Yoshiki, and so I did um, multi-dingalization for Squeak, and have some curious about what you did here. And the one question. Is that let's say I want to make um, like a Japanese Chinese dictionary application that requires you to display uh, characters differently, even though they may have the same code point, you know, in single text field. Perhaps can you do that? Well, that's one of the limitation of. I mean, if you're talking about not Unicode but code page dependent. No, 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 Unicode. But Han Unification in the, introduced this idea that even the Unicode code point, same code point, has to know which basically font to agree to use. Well, what, what the, the the Unicode uh, specification doesn't actually say anything about how you display that. So, if you have a one code point. It doesn't 
say anything about the font you use. So we assume you have a font that's going to be able to display that particular code. Yeah, right? so it's easy if there's no mix of those in one string object. But let's say you want to have one kind of unicode string of some kind, but you do want to display it um, with different uh, font associated in different parts of the same string. Uh, that would be like a UI with your thing. I mean, I can show you in our workspace. I th we, we can test that later on the workspace because in in last year's Smalltalk presentation, I, I gave actually our Unicode implementations even uh, deals with directionality. So actually when you try to access the last element, it's going to be the one that you're expecting to be the last and not the one that is actually displayed as the last one. So we, we can test that later on the workspace. But Yes, I mean, I on the I used in an um, in example last year, I, I mixed, I think it was Chinese and Hebrew. Basically, you 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 could get both characters in the same string and just navigate them. Actually, yeah, the that's an easier case. But actually, doing that for Japanese and Chinese is harder. Okay, we we can do this later because that's that that will be a good proof. Thank you.